in the midst of utter woe, when our sins oppress us, where shall we for refuge go? Where for grace to bless us? To thee, Lord Jesus, only. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the work of his Holy Spirit. Dear Christian friends, this morning we will pay attention in turn to each of the lessons that we've heard. But first, this question for you. Who do you trust? Who do you trust? Now, if you're old enough and gray enough, you may even remember that as the title for a television show. You would get a contestant. And at least as I remember it, then there would be three panelists, and each panelist would have a lovely story to tell, fascinating and captivating. And it was up to the contestant to decide who they would trust, which one was telling the truth. Now, let me acknowledge there was then this grammar debate because it should actually be whom do you trust? But we're going to let that go. The question this morning is who do you trust? And I ran into that in a different form yesterday. I was down at Camp Omega. Some of you are acquainted with it for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod in southern Minnesota. It's our district camp. And lo and behold, I got a Camp Omega t shirt with nothing on the back of it. And I also got a Camp Omega t-shirt with the word guide on the back of it. That's the title for their leadership staff for this summer. And it occurred to me, hmm, so if I'm confused or lost, or I'm wondering what's the next part of the program, who do I trust? Blank or guide? Who do you trust? And we get some evidence for this, some suggestions, some instructions from Scripture, already in the Old Testament lesson, if you want to follow along and pay attention to a bit of it. It's on page 3. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of Israel. This was the dedication event for this awesome temple in Jerusalem. Now, if you don't mind my taking you back, this is a thousand years before Jesus. I want to go 400 years before that. Moses is leading, God is through Moses, leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the Promised Land. And particularly when they are assigned to, consigned to 40 years in the wilderness, God has an act of mercy. I want to give you a mark that I am with you. There was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. But as well, he said, make a tabernacle. It could have been Minnesota, but what he's saying is make a tent. But this is a very big tent and instructions for how to make it awesome and lovely. And so they could take the tent with them as they journey, a mark of the presence of God. And then they enter Palestine, they enter the land of Israel. Finally, they take the city of Jerusalem, actually under David's leadership, they've conquered the city of Jerusalem, and it becomes the high point for Jewish life, because it is up in the mountains. And then there's Mount Zion in Jerusalem, as high as you can get. And that's where they're going to build a temple, so that you no longer have a wandering mark of the presence of God, that you have this awesome sanctuary that Solomon is building. And then we come to the dedication. And if you've caught my emphasis so far, this has all been the Jewish people, the Jewish people, the Jewish people, the people of Israel. This is the temple by which God marks his presence with them. And then Solomon comes to the dedication prayer. By the way, the cloud kind of chases him out of the temple. The same sense of cloud when Jesus is transfigured. Cloud is a mark of the presence of God. Doesn't get much better than this temple with this cloud mark the presence of God. And Solomon stands before the altar for all the people of Israel and says, As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, because of who you are, God, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When they come and pray, then hear from heaven and pay attention to them, to the other people. 
And I will tell you, there's a sad part of Jewish history, Israelite history after that, they kind of forgot it was the mark of God and came close to making the temple itself and the ceremonies God. We've got the temple of the Lord. We're good because we've got the temple of the Lord. There was a time for judgment. But at this point, in their great celebration, Solomon prays also for the others. And I wonder who the others would be as we would think about this in the 21st century. About a hundred and some years ago for St. Stephanus, when we were all Germans, or mostly Germans, other might have meant the Swedes and the Norwegians. Who would the others be? How would you fill in that blank today? Some of you know that Miriam and I have traveled around the world. We have very often been the other with Christian brothers and sisters in China, in Indonesia, in India. So I wonder when you think about who the others are, there's a sense in which it does not matter. We all have our own gifts of our family background, our ethnic background. It hardly matters because we can worship the one God who has shown himself in Jesus Christ, whoever we are as others. Let me stretch that just a little bit. You can be the mark of God's love to others who don't know that love yet, whether of your own family or your neighborhood. You can be praying for them, you can be visiting with them, you can even experiment with other foods as a kind of courtesy and getting along. And you become a mark of the presence of God's love for others as you do that. But this is our gift, one gift from Solomon as he's prayed this prayer and dedication. Oh yeah, the other. Let the others be welcome as well in the presence of God and his love in Jesus Christ. It's almost the reverse in the Galatians reading on the next page. Is this all about us? If you notice that going on, Paul introduces himself, an apostle, to the churches in Galatia, in what would be modern-day Turkey. Okay? Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. And so again, we have this sense of, hmm, what's God been doing? How has God been present? He's been present in the most magnificent way in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's concern here, almost reflected in our text, to be Lord Jesus only. Paul's concern here shows up in verse 6. I'm astonished. He's not pleased. I am astonished that you were so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. These are not the other at all. This is addressed to us who have heard the gospel. And Paul is astonished that those in Galatia had so quickly given it up for something else. To get a sense of the importance of Paul's point here, I'm actually going to take you back to grammar from school. Some of you remember back there. You learned how to write a letter. And it started with a greeting, and then it was the body of the letter, and then the complimentary close. Sorry, I forgot the date before the greeting. Complimentary close, and then the signature. There was a form, there was a way to write letters at least 50 years ago. There's a bit of that now on Twitter or an email. You know, we use these abbreviations. There was a form, there was a way, a pattern to write letters when Paul was writing in the first century. You started with your own name, so they didn't have to roll all the way to the scroll to find out who was sending it. You started with your own name, to whom you were writing, then some kind of blessing, and then a thanksgiving, and then the body of the letter itself, and a closing. Did you get all of those parts? You start with the name of the sender, the name of the receiver, a short blessing, a big thanksgiving, and then the body of the letter. You can see that in any letter of Paul in the New Testament, he wrote according to the culture of his time. Except in Galatians, where the issue is critical. You want to follow it with me on page 4? You see the first point? Oh yeah, there's the sender, Paul, and apostle. Who are the receivers? Churches in Galatia. What comes next? A short blessing, grace and peace to you. And what comes after that is not a thanksgiving. It's not a thanksgiving at all. Paul is critically concerned that these Christians 
have turned from the gospel of Jesus Christ to anything else which is no gospel at all. We see his focus. You've deserted the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. Mm -hmm. What would that look like in our day? Not just Jesus, Jesus is good enough, but Jesus and, Jesus and, how would you fill in the blank? Jesus and money, then I'm okay. Jesus and good grades or a better house, and then I'm okay. Jesus and a healthy sexual life, and then I'm okay. How would you fill in the blank? And by the way, we have numbers of religions around us who are Jesus and. I wish to speak very courteously, but seriously, for Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, it's Jesus and. There's something else. Paul's instruction is, Jesus is in him. By the way, this is the problem in the sense that Adam and Eve had already in the garden. Oh, God, we're happy to walk with you and talk with you during the day, but of course, we're also happy to have something else as well, and then plucked the fruit. This is called sin. That's what's at the heart of our sinfulness. Well, yeah, God, you're nice. God am. God am. You can take this kind of test in your own life. When you're grumpy, when you're angry, when you're unhappy, what's the thing that you're missing? You can test yourself that way. What have you added to Jesus? Jesus and this makes a good life. Not according to Paul. According to Paul, it's God's grace in Jesus Christ, and that's enough. By the way, that's what's important for us as Lutherans. We celebrate baptism. The pastor speaks a word of forgiveness. We come to the Lord's Supper. And the point in every case is Jesus. This is a place where God marks his presence in Jesus Christ for us today. It's not the ceremony. It's not the routine. It's not the temple. It is the God who comes to meet us in Jesus Christ in each of those places. I am astonished that you were so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Jesus Christ. And our New Testament reading, our Gospel lesson for today, pushes the point that much further. We're in Luke chapter 7. You may remember the story. Jesus had done some teaching, and he entered the city of Capernaum. The centurion's servant was ill, and the leaders in the community, the religious leaders, came to Jesus with a message. Oh, please help this man. Please help this man's servant, because he's such a good man in our community. Jesus said, okay, we can do that. And he's on his way to the centurion's house. And the centurion himself then sends his own messenger, said, ah, I don't even need you to come here. You know, I'm the man under authority, and I know about authority for the people who are under me. And I know that you are one who has authority. So you don't even have to come to my house to take care of this. Mm -hmm. Who do you trust? Who do you trust? The centurion makes it very clear for us that we're going to trust, we're invited to trust Jesus. What a gift that can be for us. I know I struggled with this very text for many years because when Jesus says, oh, so great a faith, I think, mm hmm, so I've got to try harder. I have to believe better. I'll, I'll, you know, just, just give me to tomorrow and, and I'll believe more and my life will be fine. Well, that's called Jesus and that's what Paul was rebuking. When all my focus is on me, I would get healed if I would believe more. I wouldn't have any trouble with the sin if I would believe more. These people would just be fine and we could cure world hunger or something if I would just believe more. We've just made it Jesus and the centurion is quite clear. He knows what the authority is. The authority is in Jesus, and that's enough. Paul's rebuke has been quite clear. It's not Jesus and, it's Jesus. I invite you to trust Jesus. Not least to trust Jesus as he meets you in this sacrament today at the altar. I invite you to trust Jesus. Who do you trust? The man of authority. Who do you trust? Jesus.